I wondered if for the sake of the audience that we, if we could go around um, and everyone introduce themselves very briefly and say whether or not you voted remain or leave and whether or not you think we should somehow resist the results of the referendum. Um, I think maybe we'll start with Anthony and then move around in an anti-clockwise direction. Okay, I'm Anthony O'Hare and I'm Professor of Philosophy at Buckingham University <coughs> and also the Director of the Royal Institute. But I should emphasise, although I hope it wouldn't need emphasising, that I am not speaking on behalf of the Royal Institute. But so many people in this business have taken it upon themselves to speak on behalf of institutions, but I am certainly not. I'm very happy to be engaged in this discussion with a number of people who I think disagree with me because I voted very firmly for out and I don't think that there should be any rehash of this business. Okay, Jen? Yeah, I'm Jen, Jennifer Hornsby and I'm Professor of Philosophy at Birkbeck University of London and likewise I won't speak for my institution. <laughs> um, so I think I, that's a given for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, okay. Less danger of uh, mm -hmm. being thought to be doing so. Mm -hmm. um, and I voted Remain and felt strongly that that was the right way to vote. And as for um, whether there should be some way to resist the vote, which evidently went against what I was supporting, um, I think I don't know what the possibilities are, so I'm, I would have to hedge on that question. Um, but I, I, I think I certainly think that Article uh, 50 should be triggered by Parliament and not the Royal Prerogative, and if you like, for democratic reasons. Okay. David? I'm David Papineau, I'm Professor of Philosophy at King's College London and the City University of New York. Uh, I voted remain. Uh, as to whether we should resist, well, as I voted remain, I rather hope things will develop in such a way that would satisfy my initial uh, position, but for reasons I expect we will come to. I don't think that that can really happen. It seems to me Parliament now has a duty to to bring about our exit from Europe. And we'll come back to what might happen, but I don't think there's any two ways about it. That's what's going to happen, it seems to me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm Anthony Grayling. I'm a Professor of Philosophy and Master of the New College of the Humanities. I voted to remain. And I'm discovering that it is possible to vote uh, Rather, as you can speak furiously, you can vote strongly or emphatically, <laughs> and so on. I'm voted emphatically to remain. Uh, I do think that uh, Brexit, as it's come to be called, should be resisted, um, and I think there are very good reasons for that, which we could explore. Okay, I thought um, an interesting place to begin with would be thinking about referendums more generally, and whether or not referendums are actually even a sensible part of democracy to begin with. Um, do, you, do you want to start by giving some thoughts on that? Yes, uh, um, there are um, polities where uh, referendums or referenda are used. Um, Switzerland is a good example. Uh, but uh, in a representative democracy such as the one that we have here, uh, they are alien to the system. And the reason that they are is that uh, direct democracy is um, a a rather dangerous way of, of, of doing things in some circumstances and a, a very ineffective way of doing things in most circumstances where legislation is very complex and requires a good deal of consideration and thought and information. And uh, uh, referendums tend to be put in a, a single yes, no, in, out uh, kind of way. Uh, and um, unless there is some provision for ensuring a, a supermajority, as it might be, or a, a really proper uh, debate and proper information beforehand, um, then we see the logic of the representative democracy, which is where, uh, in a recordable, periodic way, we send uh, plenipotentiaries to the legislature to think, to find out, to discuss, debate, and do things on our behalf. And if we don't like it, then we can recall them. Um, that we do like it, we can let them go on. But the referendum, you can't do that. And it tends to be very simplistic. And all that's worst about direct democracy can result. It can degenerate into what's sometimes called ochrocracy, which is a sort of yeah. you know, 
more room in that attitude. Does, any, does anyone else think that, that, that referendums are problematically simplistic in that way? I think it depends what the question is. I mean, I think direct, direct democracy can be appropriate locally where people are well placed to know the issues. And of course, in um, Switzerland, which Anthony mentioned as having plenty of um, referendums in their cantons, they've got a rather firm federal government to which they elect, so it's, they're not uh, competing um, to a great extent with one another. Um, so I think it, it really does depend whether one thinks that voters are in a position to think that one or other view is in their interests and to vote accordingly, if it's going to be not an election, but a referendum. Um, and I happen to think that just wasn't the case uh, mm -hmm. for the referendum just passed. That's something I think we're going to talk a bit about later on. So I agree with Jim that there are issues, especially at the local level, where it's just a matter of what people want. I mean, should the centre of Kentish Town be pedestrianised? We have any vote on that. Perfectly, perfectly appropriate. But I also think that, that major matters of national trajectory are certainly pretty straightforward issues that uh, it's a matter of finding out what people want. And in fact, it's not true that referenda are entered into the British system. I think we've had something like 11 in the past 50 years, uh, including lots about devolution and this and that. But most strikingly, we had a referendum about going in mm. to the common market. Mm. Now, there's a further question about, you can't keep on doing this all the time, and why exactly did we do this one now? And we might debate about that, and I don't think we will, because it's not about politics. It was, it was it a, an appropriate thing to call this referendum, but I, uh, it seems to me a perfectly appropriate subject to have a referendum on, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's not alien to our history at all. Yes, I mean, obviously we can argue endlessly about the minutiae of what is or isn't democratic. Um, I actually would go slightly deeper and consider what Karl Popper says in The Open Society and Its Enemies, that the most important aspect of an open society is that the people um, have a chance regularly to eject the rulers and in this case to go against what they have imposed on them. And I think why this referendum was particularly interesting was because it wasn't just the rulers, it was a whole gang of bigwigs and grandees from President Obama to Catherine Lagarde to Mark Carney to Angela Merkel, to say nothing of all the three major political parties, were all telling the people to do something and the people didn't. And I think part of the reason for that was that it is true, as David has just pointed out, that in 1975 there was a referendum for what was then the uh, common market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. People voted for something. What they got in the end was quite different from what they had voted for. And I think there was increasing irritation, to put it no stronger, among large swathes of the population, that they wanted the chance to revisit this decision of 1975. And I think, I think actually, this was a healthy phenomenon, whichever way it had gone. Can I just interrupt you, though, just to, yeah. just to bring up the question that we've been discussing a little bit, but to attack it head on, as it were. How should referendums be used? Because something that you're alluding to actually is that there hadn't been a referendum on the EU well, for such a long time. Yeah. No, but you know, yeah. um, people voted in, and then there's this huge long period where mm -hmm. people felt like they, they didn't have a say. Well, I think they didn't really feel they didn't have a say. I think many of them felt they were cheated but because they were, sold, they were sold a completely incorrect idea but, as things turned up. But what does oh. that, what, how, should, how should referendums then be used? So it, it, it feels like um, with, the, with the EU in particular, there's a slight randomness to, uh, uh, to put it politely, to, to the, for, for this one being called. Um, and it wasn't, there hadn't been one for years, which um, I actually agree with you. Doesn't seem right. But then how should, how should referendums be called and why? So I was thinking about this before we got together, 
And I was kind of of the view that Cameron had called it foolishly to fix some little problem. But the more I thought about it, on an issue like this, the natural impetus for having a referendum, if there's, if there's a groundswell of opinion, and in this case, there has been, to the extent a political party was formed just on this particular issue. Mm. And the political party was threatening to split the Conservative Party. And so it wasn't just a minor fix that Cameron was up to. He was, in a way, responding to a groundswell of opinion for a referendum. So I'm, it's not obvious to me. Can, can I say that? I do, I do think, uh, uh, contrary to what uh, Anthony thinks, that we should get into the minutiae of questions about democracy. Mm. And what we shouldn't do is get into the minutiae, unless we want to do this properly, of history. Because uh, the, the remarks that have been made about the history of this matter are, mm. are, are not accurate. I didn't say that referenda are alien to our history. I said they're alien to representative democracy. And, that there is, and so therefore the minutiae of that debate really needs to be explored. Mm -hmm. And the, the point being that uh, in representative democracy we have periodic uh, elections at which we send people to uh, a legislature to do some really detailed thinking on our behalf, to look into things and to take some decisions. And then we have recall on those decisions at the next election. And something which is as complex as our membership of the European Union. Let us not forget that the European Union Act of 1972 had been accepted by both Houses of Parliament three years before that referendum was held. So that, there was, that was something anomalous about that situation. But what it did was it began a process of conferring a whole range of rights on citizens of the UK who in 1992 became citizens of the European Union and uh, uh, an enormous range, a great multiplicity of connections and responsibilities, contractual obligations between different aspects of UK, the UK economy and society and other uh, polities in Europe. The unravelling of which is going to take, if it does happen in the end, uh, a great deal of work and thought and care. So to ask people are we going to do it or not, just blankly like that, without exploring the, the consequences, without looking at them, which would be the duty of elected where, representatives, is, I think, the essential point of where, this. Where, where, the the, 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 the candidate pedestrianisation... <laughs> we will yes be no. talking. Okay. We're actually going to be able to talk about that dimension. I voted, I voted to remain largely because of concerns about the unravelling, but the truth is that not everybody shared my concerns. They felt the price was worth the cost. We're going to get on to the specifics yes. of, the, of this debate later. I wanted to pick up on the first of the two points that Anthony made. I mean, I agree with uh, Anthony Graham about the history, which is um, it's an opportunity to eject leaders. It seems to me that, that there is indeed an opportunity to do that in an election, and you know what you're getting instead, because you're voting, as it were, against those whom you want to eject. But I, I thought one thing problematic about the referendum on the EU was that um, we didn't know what we were going to get. I mean, those who voted leave, I don't think there's any determinate description um, that any of them could give we're of what we're the country would be like in 10 years' time by virtue of having left the EU. That's, where we're, that, that's something that we're going to move on oh, to talk about and, 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 but, and, and give some time to. if we're to making a distinction between elections and referendums, then I think it is... It's absolutely central. Yeah. I'm just going to cut yeah. in at this point because I think we're getting too caught up in the, in the, in the specifics. Um, and just to kind of keep it on a, 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 perhaps a more abstract level, um, there's this thought, David, you've had that... Um, uh, sometimes re referendums are called because there's a groundswell of opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and so I suppose one charge against referendums is that they uh, pander to popularist opinions. Um, and that could be potentially dangerous. So, I mean, do people... Don't, don't see, I mean, I've got, if we abstract away from the content of these opinions in these movements, I mean, what's more democratic than uh, the referendums responding to a number of people wanting to have a vote on the issue. That seems to me that so, would be going So say, for example, people wanted to have a, a, a vote about capital punishment. If, if there was such a feeling that people formed a capital punishment party and started winning seats and was forcing the Conservative Party into difficulties, then I fear I would be, from the point of view of democracy, uh, uh, I think we should have a referendum. And if we brought back countries on a terrible, terrible thing, it would make me sick in my heart, but there it is. We're in a democracy. That's my view. 
Can I just no? respond to what? I mean, that's not going to happen in that situation at all. It isn't a, a movement to bring about capital punishment. Thank if, goodness. If it's about misinformation, we're definitely going to talk about it's, that. It's later. not about misinformation. Okay, no, sorry. No, no, no. Well, we could, it's, it's, Jen, it's Jen's specific point mm. about ejecting people. Mm. What was ejected mm. was the whole European um, uh, form of government, which, which is thoroughly undemocratic, with the European Commission unelected with great power, the Council of Ministers, a club of leaders who have no, um, they can't be called back, they can be called back individually, but they get together and decide things together. I was actually told by the Prime Minister of another country, and I'm not going to tell you which one, that he liked being in the EU because it enabled him to get things through his own parliament that he would have no chance of getting through were he to take but it to his own parliament. And this strikes me as fundamentally undemocratic. But I wonder and, and, and therefore, the, the, the referendum gave the people of this country a chance to extricate themselves from this lock. But I wonder, I wonder if, if anecdotes like that are necessarily well, the, way to, the, way to, to, the way, to, way to go in this conversation. And, and, and I, think, I, think, I think something that keeps coming up and that we should definitely maybe move into now is this notion of, of information or misinformation and the complexity of the issue, I suppose, versus the simplicity of the question. And um, I wonder, um, Jen, if you might want to say something about the impact um, you think information or, dare I say, misinformation might have had on the, on the vote. I think misinformation had a tremendous effect on the vote. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I could give some examples. I, I don't think that the Remain side, which I was on, was totally honest, but I also think that they... Um, could have run a better campaign. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that um, I'm, I'm told that a lot of people who voted um, leave, I'm, I'm sure this isn't true of Anthony, um, subsequently have thought that they wished they hadn't. Regrets it, but, <laughs> the least it's called. <laughs> ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So presumably they become aware that they have been misinformed. Mm -hmm. um, so why, why, why is it exactly that you think that mis misinformation affects whether or not it was dem democratic? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I suppose we have an ideal of democracy by which informed citizens uh, want their interests furthered and um, thus can participate in a process by which their interests come to get furthered by policy being enacted. Um, but you can't be in that situation if the said citizens actually believe all sorts of falsehoods. Um, it, it is true that there were things that were said on both sides that may have been exaggerated, although I actually do have the leaflets here, it's not quite so clear that they were actually falsehoods. However, these were said very early on in the campaign, and they were endlessly contested and refuted, and if, if the population didn't hear that, they were just deaf, because you could hardly turn on the radio or the television television, but you, you could hardly listen to the public media without hearing these things contradicted, refuted, whatever you like. So actually, I, I think in all election campaigns, people exaggerate, um, and then the other side comes back and, and corrects them, and then, then people can make their own minds up. I have to say that I do think some of the things that were said, particularly on the Brexit side, were disgraceful, absolutely disgraceful. And not merely said, but depicted. But, but I, I think that, that, that there's a, a more general point here, and it feeds in actually to the point of principle, which, which I think could be very, very interesting to discuss, and that is that um, since we, since the United Kingdom joined the European Community and subsequently the, the EU after Maastricht, um, the uh, a relentless campaign, and it's not a recent groundswell of opinion, the UKIP was formed very soon after uh, UK accession to the European Community. But uh, a, a relentless campaign of hostility to the European Union, especially in the tabloid press, Daily Mail, Daily Express, and I mean to talk about some of the disgraceful and falsehoods and misrepresentations, one has only to look at the front pages of those newspapers over these many years. And quite unlike other EU countries, where the national flag and the EU flag fly side by side, and people are perfectly conscious of the benefits uh, of EU membership. 
there has been relative silence in this country about it. So in one way, it's not merely the case that the Leave campaign over the last couple of months before the referendum was, was uh, supported by a, a mass tabloid press and full of disinformation and even in some cases downright lies, but, but also that the whole tendency of opinion in the country has been liberated for a very long time. Now the EU is a very imperfect organisation. It is not an undemocratic one. Uh, we cannot complain in this country if we take no interest in elections for MEPs. But there is a European Parliament which votes on things that the Council of Ministers and the Commission of the EU, which is its civil service, put to the Parliament. So it's not totally undemocratic, it's just very big. Uh, and, and therefore, you have to take into account the imperfections and be part of making them better. But that's, that's so, so to speak, not the issue. The real issue that we should be, to be discussing is this. What, what place does a, a, a referendum on such an important matter the whole entire future of the country and its relationship with the rest of Europe, its economy and the young people in, in our country. What, what, what place did a referendum have in our kind of democratic system? What do we mean by democracy? On the one hand, we're quite right, I'm sorry, I know I'm going on no, again, but I, I do want to make the point that, that um, we are and should be good democrats. That's to say we should think that adult and franchised uh, members of our society should participate in, in government. Jennifer made the point, and it's a very good one, that the electorate in a democracy needs to be informed. Famously, mm -hmm. Churchill's second remark about democracy was that its strongest argument against it is two minutes conversation with any voter. And this is because of the problem of lack of information, short-term termism, self-interest, and so on. And we don't have an ideal uh, electorate that is thoughtful, informed, and always voting in the interests of everybody. And therefore, we have to evolve over time a system of democracy, namely representative democracy, with institutions that filter the less desirable effects of direct democracy. And that is a key point here, which is why, given the referendums express a direct democratic mm. view, it uh, is problematic. Could, yeah. I, could I say something? Uh, I agree there's been a long history of making fun of the EU. I think that's peculiar to this country. If you speak to people in France or Italy, they have just the same view of EU bureaucracy, its ridiculousness, its wastefulness, its restrictiveness. Uh, so that's that's one issue. But I mean, I, I, I agree that there's been uh, a long history. It's not a recent thing. But as to the the recent campaign, I think I have a much my view of my fellow citizens than, than you do. I mean, if, and if, if you were right, and the average citizen is not terribly clever at working these things out, and is just going to listen to what they're told, then it would be amazing that they got to know, because as Anthony pointed out earlier, all the great and the good from across the world came in. You mentioned Obama, Carney, George Soros, yes, Elizabeth Soros. Manning, <laughs> uh, Elizabeth <laughs> Manning Bullet, they all had. And, and not, to mention, not, not to mention, not to mention, midwives, George, not to mention Osborne and Cameron. I was just uh, going to intervene in the debate, yeah. such as there is that now between um, Anthony and David. Um, I mean, I think if one thinks about the matter empirically, mm -hmm. one will discover that electors, and this is in general actually, not just in relation to referendums, are very uninformed. I mean, you know, there can be a question about nuclear weapons, say, so last on how many um, nuclear bombs have there been in history, and how many countries have had nuclear weapons, and they get all the answers wrong. And this is a sort of random sample of people who will be opinion to see how they vote. Um, they just know next to nothing which some people might think relevant to what should happen next. So I think um, electors in general are uninformed. And actually, I think we have to remember that things like the rule of law and freedom of speech um, are components of the democracy we care about. Um, I think it's too easy to valorise elections, actually, um, and thus especially referendums, which uh, aren't even elections. I wonder, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm just disinclined to believe what you said. You said empirical research shows that people... Well, it's know, from Princeton uh, University uh, Press, and it's been published very recently. Um, yeah. And I wish I could remember the author's name, so they with A and B. But, yeah. um, I mean, they're just summing up, and, uh, right. because they've done um, 
mainly posing and asking mm. people questions, and mm. they sampled but widely, and they found a in massive ignorance of mm. recent That's history, good. politics. Maybe to bring it back a little bit, so um, it seems that all of these questions uh, are questions of um, epistemology to a certain extent. We, we need to know uh, whether or not politicians are lying. Uh, and then there's also the question about um, how we know what the will of the people is. Um, and I, I don't want to talk about the will of the people. I don't believe the people is a thing, and I don't believe that it's got a will. It's strange, because you mentioned the people when, in your opening statement. Um, well, so it would be, and you said that the people voted against well, the establishment. Well, that was shorthand to say 17,410,472 people voted for, and was it 16,000 million voted against? It, is, it happens to be the biggest number of people that have ever voted for anything in this country. And I don't want to talk about the will of the people, because um, I think in a healthy society, which I think I hold a higher opinion of the society perhaps than some of my colleagues, um, I think disagreement is of the essence. And obviously a lot of people don't, didn't agree. So I don't want to talk about the will of the people. But I suppose the question I is the why, they didn't dis why they didn't agree. So oh, how, they, they how, didn't, they how didn't, didn't, they didn't agree because was the motivator of the votes? Because, yes. it, because it's a contested issue. And, and I think that one thing that's depressed me is, is the thought, not that I'm sure anybody here, that, that um, all the people who voted for out were old and uneducated. And this was a widely expressed view, um, not only in this country, I, I was in Europe just after the election, and this was very widely said by big wigs there too. Um, the, the, all the educated people voted but, to remain. But both and sides have made those arguments well, about I, each other. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not making, no, I'm, I'm trying to resist that, that, that kind of argument. Of course, yeah. Um, so, so Adam said, let's not do epistemology and it's about <laughs> will, but I do actually think these things are connected. I mean, I wanted to have a, a drink from that jug, um, knowing it to be water. And uh, if I'd... Uh, been ignorant so that actually it was neat gin or something. I wouldn't have wanted to. I mean, you, you really can't think that people can know what's in their best interests unless they know what some of the facts are. Do you think? Do you think this um, particular? Do you think this particular referendum? I mean, we, we've, it's, we've been talking about democracy quite generally, um, and I think that's been a necessary part of things. But do you think this particular referendum? Um, there was, there was, an. A real, uh, there was more exaggeration, misinformation, um, you know, downright lies than, than there have been in, in, in other. And does that make it less democratic or undemocratic? I think it was yeah. perhaps the nature of the. I mean, I, I, I do think the level of the debate was appalling, and exaggerated claims of uh, ridiculous sorts were made on both sides. and. It was all disappointing, but perhaps that's a consequence of the nature of the issue. It's not like a general election, there's lots of issues. There's one issue and you want to push your side, and so you just make as many claims that will support your side. As, I, mean, I actually thought Jeremy Corbyn, many people feel, uh, was not very helpful to the main campaign, and I think that's probably true, but his utterances where he said, well, uh, there's a number of issues, and uh, these things are for, these things are against, and uh, on balance, I'm for Remain, was, was it a sane and healthy attitude. We didn't get that from one other politician. I mean, uh, what do you think about the, yeah. the, the, the question of accountability here? Mm -hmm. I think that, that's interesting. So you have, you have, say, Nigel Farage, you have Jeremy Corbyn saying various things. Mm -hmm. um, but the nature, the nature of referendums, surely, is that there's, there's not necessarily any immediate accountability over those claims that were made? I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? I do. I, I think that, that that's one of the deficits of uh, referendums, that uh, um, people can say things or, or promise things and indeed uh, not be expected to deliver afterwards. In the immediate aftermath of the referendum, indeed, uh, um, everybody who was leading the campaign to leave the EU uh, decamped. And it was only by some, uh, as so far, inexplicable um, reason that one of them came back into office. 
Uh, <laughs> some people have got actually to wreck the Brexit enterprise, I don't know. But, um, so, so I think that's a very important point. Accountability is key and, and indeed lies, underlies the whole point of, a, again, a representative democracy with the fact that there is this constant democratic supervision by the electorate of the people who are sent on our behalf to look into things like health and safety regulations and air traffic control and labour laws and all the complexities which our uh, wonderful fellow citizens are not interested in, don't have the time to devote to it uh, and if they were asked on a weekly basis to vote in referendums on such matters probably wouldn't make a very good job of it and probably would stop voting after a while. So let me ask you this just, just really briefly and um, maybe we can... If there's a lack of accountability sort of built into referendums or, or referendums, um, referenda, does that does that affect whether it's democratic or not? Yes, it does. I, I want to agree with Anthony mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that um, I think generally speaking, um, it is better if there is a legislature that examines laws and whatnot. I mean, I haven't a clue about air tra traffic control or any of these things or sugar in my children's drinks or all these things that were con constantly being inflicted. <laughs> um, and, but, but I think what this referendum was about was who should do the controlling. I think it was actually fundamentally about control of the legislature, control of the executive. And the reason that I was in favour of coming out was that we were continually um, inflicted with laws from Brussels over which we had no control. Just to take some recent examples, VAT on but fuel. We're not going to get into well, but, but I think this is the point. That, that on what people, clinical trials, working time directed, whether we can deport foreign criminals, the point is that the people who voted to leave wanted our parliament to control these things and not the dubiously democratic system which existed in Europe, trying to impose a unitary system on, on 28 off. countries. I think we're getting off topic a little bit here. Well, I think I think I'd, well, I'd, I think this would do with democracy. It, it, I, I think what we were, what I was trying to get a fairly straight answer um, from everybody on was the issue of accountability, which yes, you were discussing, but whether whether um, that. Well, I agree. It is about accountability. Who is accountable for our laws? But whether, but whether. The accountability is very specifically within the, the, the referendum campaigns. Well, I mean, there, well, was, was, there was accountability was, in the um, sense that Osborne and yeah, Cameron yeah. Let, went straight away, having... Uh, well, Ma Michael Gove gave, gave, gave several speeches about that it was mm -hmm. about control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, I was, I was going to say that what's been said. Mm -hmm. um, I think an interesting place to move on to now would be... Um, the notion of a second referendum, um, which uh, is going to be debated in Parliament, I think, on September the 5th. Um, there has been a huge online petition mm -hmm. for for this to happen. And I wondered um, if, Jennifer, you might, might give your opinions on whether, whether that's worthwhile, whether it's democratic. I'm unsure what a second referendum would be, because as I see it, one of the problems of the first referendum was we we didn't know what leave meant. It's fine to say Brexit means Brexit, but I still don't know what Brexit means. So you can't just have the same referendum over again, even if you think that a lot of people would change their minds, so somehow that would repair the situation insofar as people would be misinformed. So I'm, I'm actually unclear what the possible choices are. I mean, I'd be extremely interested to know um, which one might find out from opinion polls. The extent to which people have changed their minds, and it could of course be on either side of the vote that they change their minds. That so might be a book, help me here. It would seem to be perfectly appropriate for <coughs> Parliament, having figured out negotiations, what the deal would be, to then take it back to the, the population and say, What do you think about that? The trouble is, as far as I can see, there's no way to get that yeah. because. Yeah. Uh, we can't really fix a deal till we trigger Article 50, and once you trigger Article 50, it's not within our power to get back in. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't see where there is going to be a second referendum. Or you don't think that it's kind of compromising of democracy to hold a second referendum? 
Well, you say hold the second mm. referendum as if it were a repeat referendum. Mm. Yeah. But I again, to hold a referendum on this issue, with, which will have turned yeah. out a slightly different issue as history unfolds. Right. No, mm. I don't think it would be undemocratic. I was, I was just going to say, I think, I and mean, that's interesting, because I think as it stands, it's a second referendum with exactly the same question. And, 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 and I think you make an interesting point that um, at the minute it's, it's speculation and they're, they're, the, the terms are basically remain exactly the same. Um, there, there isn't necessarily any more clarity on exactly what will happen. I, mean, I, I suppose it's conceivable that um, when it's determined this is Article 50 having been triggered, what our um, continuing relations with the EU, if any, would be. We could then see whether that was what the country wanted. It might even be that if they said no, we could uh, somehow rejoin. Well, that's a bit that's not clear to you. I mean, I mean, it's not clear. We'd be voting to no, rejoin, but, but, but it's not but, for us to be yeah, accepted. This is, I mean, this I is why I said any of the possibilities are. But of course, there would still be questions about what trading relations, if it's possible to make with other countries, which can't be settled until we've definitely left. So I think um, there's no point in the future which we'll yeah. know what's going to happen next, at which we could ask people whether we wanted it to happen. Yeah. Does that bring us back in, in an odd kind of way to the to the to the idea of whether it was democratic or not? Because it was it was difficult to get any any real detailed information about what would actually happen if Article Fifty was triggered. Well, and it was also difficult to know what would happen if we stayed in. I mean, as we found out in 1975, we had not clue where it was going to go. So, so, so I don't. I think the lack of information point um, bears on, on both sides. If we voted to remain, who knows what what the future developments in the EU are? Particularly when it seems to be so unstable, has huge problems with the with the euro, with with migration, okay. with a lot of other countries. Maybe you know, it's very difficult to know. Where it's going to go. Okay, so, 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 so I think the, the lack of uh, lack of knowledge is, is on, on both sides, not just on on leave. Well, my strong preference is for Parliament to um, uh, step in here. It, it really ought. Uh, an advisory note, a briefing note, was put out by the House of Commons Library to MPs before a debate on the uh, referendum bill in 2015 making it in section 5 of that briefing note completely clear, I mean it iterated the point, that this was entirely advisory, it didn't mind the government, it was really to find out what public opinion on the matter was, uh, and it said that this would, was, was to be regarded as consultative, so that Parliament could uh, take a view um, afterwards on the basis of the renegotiation that uh, they would come in and had uh, undertaken with the EU. So my very, very strong preference is for Parliament to deal with this. And uh, I, I, mean, I do have a motivation which I put plainly on the table, and it is that we know that something like three quarters of members of the House of Commons and almost all the members of the House of Lords were strongly in favour of uh, remaining in the EU. I take it for well-informed and good reasons, and that uh, since they had in those proportions express those views prior to the referendum, as our, our elected representatives, we would expect them to act on them and then to stand up in the election and to see whether their electors agreed or not. So if the vote had been reversed, you don't, I mean, do you think that that, so if we voted to remain and say the leavers and um, stuff... Oh, Parliament it should, it is mm. Parliament's duty uh, and um, absolute duty really to have discussed the matter and it, and, and taking a view on what it thought this opinion poll, which is in effect what it is, um, meant. To. Yes, absolutely. Don't, don't, don't forget, I'm sorry to put it on, but don't, don't forget that the Leave campaign, uh, nobody expected them to win, not, not even them, had said that this would be very much unfinished business uh, if the vote was for remain. You could would have stayed in, you know, in, in, on the same course of, of trying to get us out of the EU. The debate would have continued, and the debate would have continued quite properly in Parliament as well. This is just on, on the point of it being very much Parliament's duty. Um, it looks as though a consequence of our leaving the EU could be that Scotland became detached from um, the UK and who knows, Northern Ireland. Um, mm -hmm. And for that to happen, the Act of Union would have to be repealed. So I don't see how you can use the royal prerogative to do something which then Parliament would be required to do, as it were. Um, 
and the, of course as a Republican myself, I'm not keen on the royal prerogative, but, but it seems to me this is a clear case where um, it ought not to be used, whatever the precedence actually. I think it's, it's interesting, again, what um, Anthony <coughs> Greening has just said, that I don't know how many people in the House of Lords and you know, the three major political parties and most of the people in them um, were in favour of remaining, which I think is, shows a very unhealthy situation, that they were clearly out of step with the majority of people in the country, or the majority that voted. And, you know, I think they should look to themselves, actually. Now look, I, I, I do think we, we, we do need to cite one or two little mm. statistics here because the 17. I, I, if I may, please. You might just come an arms race. I don't want <laughs> I mean, you both have the, the Antonies have statistics. So we, might, <laughs> we, yeah, but we must, we must, be, because uh, I mean, Antony, uh, uh, quite rightly, uh, doesn't want to talk about the will of the people. It's a bit of cant which has been greatly uh, used by other people. So let's just, let's just remind ourselves of the following that the 17 odd million people who voted to leave represent. 37% uh, of the electorate, a lot of people didn't vote, as we know, it was a 72% turnout. And that 37% of the electorate represents just over 26% of the population of the country. So we simply cannot allow ourselves to say that a majority of the population wants to leave and, and that our parliamentarians are at odds with them. On the contrary, uh, the, the point has been put, I don't know whether I believe it, I, I need uh, um, persuading, but that people who didn't vote, very many of them, um, may, may therefore have tacitly uh, um, gone along with the status quo. So it may very well be that the majority, even of the electorate, was in favour of staying in the EU. This is exactly why Parliament now has to get, get its uh, teeth into this matter and deal with it responsibly. They are our elected representatives. So I, I don't want to think about this. I mean, I'm constitutionally, I think you're right. I mean, Parliament is sovereign, and Parliament could go ahead and do what it once. And indeed, I don't think it would be unconstitutional or, or somehow uh, irresponsible them to do what you suggest. I think it would be very unwise, though. I, I think it would lead to a terribly unhealthy situation with uh, many, many people, perhaps not all the exiters, but an awful lot of them, feeling unbelievably aggrieved at having won a referendum and then just being ignored. I think it would be an awful idea. No. I don't see that. I, I'm afraid I, I, mean, I think uh, uh, it's perfectly clear from the preamble to the, the uh, referendum bill debate that this was advisory and consultative. And, and I do think that um, we're somewhere. We, we, we have a very odd situation now, you know, which is that with fixed term parliaments having been introduced by the coalition government last time around, it now takes a 66% majority of members of the House of Commons to vote for there to be an election outside the fixed term. It's, it's a lovely situation. Yes, but it's a very the Conservatives want an election, that you would find you would find Conservatives voting uh, for a vote of no confidence in their own government yes. and Labour yes. voting for the government. No, they <laughs> they <laughs> it's a very, very odd situation. Yeah. But, but, but I, 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 I mention that fact because, um, as, as someone once said, I think it might be Harold Macmillan, the week is a long time in politics. And uh, we, we are therefore four years away from the next general election in which p people who put themselves forward to positions of leadership in our society have an obligation to make the case, to explain, to give some leadership, to, to, uh, to talk about why they took a decision that they did. Mm -hmm. I would expect that um, mature, sensible uh, um, uh, activity by our uh, members of parliament, if parliament were to decide not to take the advice of the advisory referendum would precisely be to give the reasons why, to make the case. I'm going to step in at this point um, and then uh, we're going to try and... Can, can, can I just make one? I, I think the issue, your point you're making now interacts with the question about whether this was a simple issue or so unbelievably complex that people could understand. We might want to come back to yes, that. Yes, and I think, I think also I, should I, we point out that um, this is part of the reason that people are angry with Europe when I think Ireland and Denmark had referenda that went the wrong way in inverted commas and they were made to do it again and that did not increase people's esteem for either the mm. ethics or the demo democratic um, understanding of the EU and their, le and their own leaders. 
who then, because they voted the wrong way, forced another referendum on them. I think it would cause an absolute riot. So I if, if there was enough, enough, another referendum. Something which is kind of coming out um, mm. of all of this is. Dad, you rioting the street. Metaphorically. I think it would. Well, anyway. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we, so we have issues about we have issues of knowledge. So we have issues about um, how uh, we can know that we know best, right? Um, and I suppose one thing that's kind of come out. I'm going to address this to you first. Is 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 how you can be sure that your position is the most informed position, um, and why it is that you think that people who don't hold your position, just plain devil's advocate, are less informed than you are. Well, two things, and I'll try to be brief. The, the, the first is that uh, in all these matters, public policy, government and, and the rest, we're, we're dealing with many variables and lots of imponderables, which is why the political process and the democratic process that controls it should be a continuing negotiation, revisiting uh, mistakes that we make, dealing with them, trying things differently and so on. So no, nobody is in a position to, to claim that they have complete information or that they're right, but they should be able to make a case by their best lights, act on it, and be accountable for it. That, that is exactly why we have the same democracy. That, that's the first point. And I'm, I'm just going to cut in here. So you, uh, you mentioned before about manipulation by the media. Mm. Do you think that there are some people who aren't being manipulated by the media? I mean, what I mean is, do you think that you're exempt or certain people can assess what's happening um, in a more kind of level-headed way such that they're not going to be swayed by what you see and um, whatever it is, the Daily Mail or the Guardian? Well, on the principle of ab esse ab posse, since I find myself unmanipulated by the Daily Mail, I'm sure there are such people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so That's so principle that. aside, I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I think probably what I'll do is I'll go around the table and then... Um, it's, a, it's a related point to this, so maybe um, you can answer uh, so say what you're going to say anyway. But I suppose it's, it's this question about knowing what it is um, that, the, that the people want. And um, I, I think I asked you earlier, but um, it, it would be nice if you could elaborate why exactly you don't think referendums are dangerous because of um, the possibility of popularist um, and potentially dangerous um, uh, views being made constitutional, especially when you think that Parliament is sovereign, as you said. I said I wasn't worried about, about Populism, dragooning, I mean, getting referendums on the table when they shouldn't. It it's, 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 it's needs to be a very important single issue to have a referendum. I mean, I'm not advocating referendums on everything twice a week, that kind, of, that kind of thing. But I think this, so Anthony Graham keeps saying it's a terribly complicated business, it shouldn't have gone to a referendum. Uh, and you know, here said it's not it's not complicated. It was just about sort of. I, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. Here's how I see it. There, there was issue of sovereignty. Something. There was the economic business. I think everybody was. I mean, it was going to cost a bit. It wasn't. It was going to hurt our trade a bit. And then there's the issue we haven't mentioned of of immigration control of immigration. And I think many many people on the leave side were were. Uh, moved by that. Now, I have absolutely no sympathy. I'm, I'm, I'm a fanatic believer in freedom of uh, movement for people. Uh, but I think that was the issue. I think it's a perfectly straightforward issue. I don't think people who feel that they didn't like their country's character being changed by a great deal of immigration are beyond the pale. I mean, I, 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 I have no sympathy for them, but I think it's a position that, that if the majority of the people have that, uh, it's, it's not the worst thing. Uh, I mean, some of them are racist, and that is terrible, but I don't think everybody who, who is concerned about immigration is a racist. So I think it's a very simple, was a simple issue. I mean, a bit of economic cost in order to get control over immigration and other things, and uh, that was a simple issue. So I'm just going to switch over to Anthony now um, and ask, so um, you've said that the uh, people voted 
for certain reasons and um, displeasure with the EU, and I'm sure that's well, certainly people who voted to, to leave. To leave. Okay, so this is the this is the question that I have. How how is it that you know what it is that they voted for and why? I mean, you know what it is that well, they, voted, what for. they voted for. They voted but, to leave. But why was it that they voted? For that? I mean, because I, I, as I, David I, pointed out, and I'm sure that it's true that a number of people voted for racist reasons. No, I'm sorry. I was saying a lot of people voted. To control immigration, I think only a small proportion of those are racist. I think there are a, a good chunk of racists, but I wouldn't want to condemn everybody who is concerned about immigration as racist. As I, as I said myself, I am fanatic about having no immigration controls, so I have no sympathy for them, but I don't think they're beyond the point. And I don't think I want to call them all racist just because they're against immigration. That would be awful. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't really put it much better than David, David has. I mean, I don't know exactly why people voted. I hadn't asked them. Um, I think a lot of people voted to, because they felt that um, both the issue of control and, in a, in a more general sense, than immigration and immigration was obviously part of it, than the character of their country, the country for which many of their parents had fought, etc., etc., with a long history, um, was being um, changed in ways they didn't particularly like by a bureaucracy specifically that they didn't like. And what they wanted was um, to get control of um, their own laws, because as I, you stopped me saying it earlier, but, but I just gave you some examples of where laws were simply imposed on us by the EU, which people didn't often like. In addition, every law that comes to Parliament has to, has to be scrutinised to see whether it's in conformity with EU directives and whatnot. And people saw the character of their country, right or wrong, um, being subtly and not so subtly changed in ways they didn't like and which they had thought they'd given no assent to. Now, obviously, um, immigration was part of that, but I don't think all of it was immigration at all. And I think that, again, um, I probably disagree with, with David here. Um, I, I do think that... that there needs to be some reasonable control on immigration. I'm not, of course, against immigration. My own ancestors are not so far distant, were themselves immigrants. I'm in favour of immigration in a general sense, but um, I, I think that if you go to the north of England particularly, um, you will see all kinds of things um, where people do feel that, that um, their way of life has been disturbed in ways they don't like and so on. Okay, uh, so, so I, I think all those were part of the reasons, but I don't actually know exactly why everybody who voted to leave voted to leave. I think the fundamental thing was that they wanted to get control back. And if, you see, they might not get governments they liked, but at least they'd be our governments and we could get rid of them. Let's move on to <laughs> Well, I'm moving backwards, actually, because the question, as you put it, was how do we know that we know best? And I didn't take myself to know best about any of the economic matters, except insofar as I thought there were trustworthy people who were telling the truth about them. And I couldn't help noticing that when Anthony, at the beginning, talked about ejecting leaders, he mentioned Obama and Lagarde. I mean, they weren't leading us, as it were. But I, I do think that both of them are better placed to know some facts about trade and economics than I am until I've asked them. And there's the IFS and there's the Governor of the Bank of England. So I think there is such a thing as expertise on matters pertaining to politics. And one, if one takes the right view of who the experts are, one will know better than those who don't. So I guess that's the, the question is, how do you take the right view? on who the experts. <laughs> well, I think it's no accident that they've come to be uh, where they are in their professions. Um, I mean, the I mean look, it's, it's, very, it's very like, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the whole thing about, oh, we've, we've yep. you know, put, put two fingers up to the experts and so on. I mean, I'm, I, I, I rather agree with Gemma on this one, but I do think uh, as when one consults with one's surgeon or one's dentist or one's optometrist and so on about uh, yeah. you know, trusting their, their judgment, when one interrogates them, 
listen to the case that they make an explanation they give, and then one can be party to that conversation. And I think that the, the same is true about expert opinion on the economy and, and the law. Um, we can read and think, uh, try to get the information, and we can ask questions, and if we don't get satisfactory answers, then come an election, we can do about it. But I, I, I must get back to, to David here, mm. who is now beginning to worry me on the basis of our very old acquaintance, because you've forgotten uh, Mill's arguments against the kind of majoritarianism that you seem to be espousing on capital punishment and immigration. Surely, surely uh, um, questions of principle need a bit more than just a majority vote. And it may very well be that there are deep questions of principle about, let us say, capital punishment or about free movement of people where we would really want to stand against uh, uh, majority views if we very much disagree. So, so um, look, can I, can I, I, I feel I've been mis, mis, misquoted in the sense of, I gave you a hypothetical scenario which would bring it about that we had a referendum on capital punishment. Yeah, that was, I don't I'm actually suggest that. I, I don't it's think we should. I, 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 no, I'm very happy for <laughs> Parliament <laughs> to, to uh, lead the country to do what in a referendum would uh, uh, go the other way uh, on freedom of movement, on, on capital punishment. That seems to me right and good. The hypothetical scenario was that capital punishment became a single issue that led to the rise of political parties in the way the EU has, which, would, I mean, which we are close to. But if that happened, then it would seem to me it would be right to have a referendum. Let's, let's not tempt fate and say we're, no, going, to, we're, we're going to probably... Yeah, uh, yeah I think uh, we're in a position to uh, start wrapping up. That might be good. So I think possibly one thing that uh, we were thinking is that uh, what marks philosophical discussions is um, hopefully that people have <laughs> thought about things and potentially changed their minds. Um, has anybody changed their mind about anything? Is there anything surprising? Um, or do we all hold steadfastly to the views that we started with? Or any sympathies uh, with, with, with viewpoints that you didn't I'm expect to have sympathies <laughs> with? Well, may I mention something which points. doesn't make me changed my mind, but actually, I'm afraid, reinforces views I was inclined to hold, which was Anthony's account of the history of opposition to the EU. And he mentioned the Daily Mail, and I couldn't help reminding, being reminded of the Daily Telegraph in the late 1970s. Um, so, yeah, there, it, there are broader questions, actually, pertaining to how it came to be that the vote turned out the way it did. Has anyone else felt that the... Uh, position has been reinforced, particularly <laughs> during the discussion. Well, I, I, I had no change because I was already rather passionately wedded to the, the, the view that I hold. Although I, I, do, I do find interesting, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think David is right that a, a major issue in the, in the Leave mind, um, which I, I think the Leave constituency, so to speak, is very variegated. There are lots of different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and indeed, we, we now see that there are some contradictory reasons. Mm -hmm. Uh, among Leave voters, whereas there is much greater uniformity among Remain voters who who know that the EU is there, what, what it is and does, and that it's a going concern and so on. But mm -hmm. um, so, so I agree that immigration was, was a, a, a major issue, and it mm -hmm. illustrates the real problem about information and understanding here, because immigrants are necessary. We're an aging population. Mm -hmm. We need immigrants. Yes. They. They are a net benefit to the society. They don't take up welfare. They contribute to the tax base of the society. They make a great contribution. Um, I mean, just, just to give you an example, Germany, if I may, because I mean, I do think it's a tremendously important point, and it illustrates a deep problem with the referendum. When, when um, very large numbers of Syrian refugees were accepted into Germany by Angela Merkel, her reasoning for doing it was that demographic projections on the German population tell us that the current 82 million population of Germany will, by 2050, on current trends of uh, um, uh, death rates and birth rates, have reduced to something like 65 million by that time. That would be devastating to the German economy. Germany needs millions of, of immigrants every year to sustain it, itself at the moment. To take educated professional people from Syria as they are, and educated people, would be a, a wonderful thing. Now, this should reflect on us here. And the fear, the hostility, the... Uh, but we have to, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we, but we are just trying to wrap up. And, 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 and just waxing. I knew, I knew, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, 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 I think, I think we kind of need to maybe hear from David and Anthony on 
on, on anything they heard. I'm, that I'm too short to this, I'm just thinking about it. That's a, that's a terrible <laughs> argument. Germany has a birth rate. No, 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 let's not go down that route. Prison different. has a birth rate of 1.8. Do you know what I mean? David, can I just ask you that? Just, if, <laughs> sorry to go back to the, the question. Um, if there's anything that you've heard today that has sparked off anything different, um, prompted any symptoms no, that were unexpected. I'm, really friendly. I'm just the only thing that stayed with me. I'm, I'm surprised how keen Jen and Anthony Grading were on the economic experts arguing for Remain. They said a lot of city exaggerated. Oh, okay. uh, George Osborne made he got the treasury to come up with a whole lot of projections. He said he was going to have. Uh, a tax and I slash budget. Yeah. I didn't it, mention Osborne. Nicholas Sturgeon said, come off it, George Osborne, please keep your mouth shut. You're doing the Remain campaign a terrible disservice telling all these patent lies. So and surprised. what did Andrea Ledson say? On no. the basis, as she put it, of 25 years of financial experience. Yes. I think, I think <laughs> it's been shown that what yeah. um, so you the IFS was, said was close to You were surprised the that the people that you disagreed with were so silly. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I haven't changed my mind. I mean, I, I do think, um, it's, uh, although I said I was very firmly in favour of um, going out, um, I do think it's a complicated issue and in which there are arguments on both sides. I just happen to have fallen on one side and having fallen on it, I, I then thought I would campaign for it. Um, but, it, yeah, it, it, it is a it is, it's obviously a complicated issue with all sorts of imponderables. I think the problem that the EU had and has is, apart from the whole rationalist project of trying to impose the same laws on 28 countries, not united by cultural tradition, history, or anything, language even, um, is that it hasn't um, managed to um, gain the affection of, or loyalty of, of people. Um, and I think for whatever, well I think I can suggest lots of reasons why it hasn't, but, but it hasn't. And, and, okay. and, and, that, and that is why it doesn't command the, 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 the kind of affection which, which is needed to keep a, a community together. Something I was just going to um going to bring up is, um, you, you said that, that, that it's, it's full of... It's not only me, it's just that John I wasn't actually, was actually going to yeah. actually respond to what you just mm -hmm. said, but rather to mm -hmm. your comment that it's a, a, a complicated issue. Yeah. Because one of your points when we were discussing it was that the referendum was very clear. Well, it's clear, um, but, yes, but the issue... It's really, clear, yes or no, but, but the issue is complicated. Okay. Huh? Um, I think we're going to have to leave it yeah. <laughs> at that point, but um, thank you all very much for, for joining us. With respect to the first question, um, just trying to think about what it was that their various positions were. The issue was whether or not referendums are democratic or whether they function well in our democracy as it stands. And it seemed like both Anthony O'Hare and David Papenow thought that it's, it's fully democratic. Jen seemed to think that it's, it's kind of, referendums can be okay at the local level, but are, are more uh, problematic at the general level, and Anthony Grayling thought that it was a alien to representative democracy. Something that I thought was interesting about David's position, I was surprised that he, he was so clear that it was democratic, and not just democratic, but actually a great example of democracy in action seemed to be his point. And then when he pushed him a little bit on, on how referendum sh referenda should be called um, and give the example of the death penalty, he, he actually said if, if a political party came into being that was in support of capital punishment, we could legitimately and democratically have a referendum about that. I thought that was interesting because it seemed to be quite actively devolving power to the people. And then, at a later point, he then mentioned parliamentary sovereignty. Yeah, which seems antithetical to it. Uh, yeah, to and I, yeah. If, we, if we had more time, that would have been interesting to discuss, because 
they sit ra rather uneasily together, yeah. I think. And yeah. I, was I was surprised by that. No, no, I agree. I, okay, so in the second section we were talking about whether or not the EU referendum as it was conducted was democratic. Anthony O'Hare thought that it was, even though there was misinformation. Anthony Grayling thought that it, it certainly wasn't, uh, and he started media manipulation as one of the reasons why it wasn't. And Jen thought that it wasn't as well, again because of misinformation and media manipulation, um, and how that impaired the voters' ability to vote properly, yeah. democratically. And Being David, an informed voter. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and, and David Papin, I thought the question was very, very clear, and it, we, as voters, were democratically unimpaired. Mm. One thing that certainly kind of came out uh, for me was the way that they attributed to the people um, various views and said that they voted in certain ways for specific reasons, without necessarily saying exactly how they knew this. Yeah, everyone, everyone seemed very informed on exactly why everyone else was yeah. either informed or misinformed. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think that was that people seemed very sure on that question. It, and we kept coming back to that notion of misinformation. And I, I wonder if that, that was almost too big a question to be contained within the other question yeah, within, within <laughs> about else. about democracy and referenda because I mean, yeah. you're just you're you're opening up a philosophical can of worms. It's true. You know what? You know how do we know these things? Um, you know who has access to the truth? I mean all of those kind of things. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean you saw it with the with the entities where they're both debating. You know they're bringing out facts and they're bringing out statistics yeah. and, and all of these. And it's something which characterised the debate pre-referendum, uh, pre-vote, um, where everybody said, you know, I've got direct access to the truth and yeah. you don't. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so finally with the issue of the second referendum and whether it would be democratic to hold a, se a second referendum, how are people feeling about that? They were generally... I think everyone thought it was a bad idea. Yeah. Um, but for different reasons. Again, David and Anthony agreed on... I mean, there's, there's a surprising amount of agreement between them, actually. I think Anthony Grayling's point was it should there shouldn't be a second referendum because it should now go into the hands of Parliament. Yeah, the, the referendum was only advisory anyway, yes. so there's no point holding a second referendum. And Jen was saying that she it, it, it would be a bad idea to hold a second referendum on exactly the same terms, yeah. and everybody agreed with that. But then she she said, you know, I don't know what, what the terms would be for a second referendum. Yeah, I thought that was a really interesting point and that brought us back again to the initial question of, um, you know, was it democratic to have a referendum on this particular topic? Because she made the point that there, there it was almost impossible to have any clarity um, within the debate because what, what, what happens if or when we leave the EU is a matter of speculation. Yeah. I mean, we can, I mean, we can guess and make pretty educated guesses on what happens, but it's still, yeah. it's not clear. I think it's, I think it was interesting that we asked or encouraged um, everyone to quite explicitly be um, be quite generous spirited to each other's point of view etc and try and find some common ground and then when we asked them at the end um, actually I think people felt more securely entrenched yeah, exactly. in what, they, what the, the opinion with which they came to the discussion. And, and in a way it's kind of sad because these are people who are supposed to be trained to listen to arguments and to um, be mm. open to different points of view. So, um, um, but I mean, Anthony, Anthony said at the end, um, you know, when we asked about opinions changing, that, that the question was quite complicated. And he had previously said that it was pretty straightforward. It yeah. was yes or no yeah. to this question. Um, and that seemed not only to sort of a bit contradictory, but I wonder if he was maybe suggesting that he had changed his mind a little bit yeah, on that without maybe, explicitly saying, yeah, exactly. it's I have changed my mind about yeah. that. <laughs> Subconsciously, let's hope. And I wonder if he was maybe the one person who, um, whose mind was Positions. changed slightly. Yeah. Yeah.